Um, so otherwise, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Truman. Truman is with the uh, Michigan State University. Uh, he's a professor in, I uh, can't remember what you guys call yours over there, but um, I'll let Truman introduce himself. Truman? Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Truman Serbrook, and uh, I'm from the Biosystems and Agricultural Engineering Department uh, at Michigan uh, State University. Um, and this actually is the beginning of uh, what's ultimately, by the time you hear them all, a four-part series uh, dealing with saving energy on dairy farms. Uh, but we're going to just uh, look at a uh, uh, just a portion of it uh, this this week. Um, okay. So, uh, reducing energy on dairy farms. Uh, I'm getting used to all the buttons and so forth. There we go. Um, whether you're working with a, uh, uh, a stall barn, uh, whoops, got to get the right button, or with milking parlors, um, our experience has shown that there's plenty of room to save energy uh, on dairy farms, pretty much of any size. We've audited uh, dairy farms from as small as 32 cows to as much as 1,900 cows. And in all cases, we've been able to find enough energy savings to be able to to make it uh, worthwhile. So let's take a moment here before we get going and just look at some of the recent numbers. In fact, you're going to be the first group to ever have seen these numbers. We've just been crunching them from uh, over... Uh, uh, between 50 and 60 dairy farms that we have uh, had audited in, in a great amount of detail uh, recently. For example, in the, in the area of the milking systems, which is going to be the focus of what I'm going to be talking about today, uh, we find in, this is limited to just farmstead energy, not including that that might be used in field operations. So if you take a look at the amount of uh, energy that is used on dairy farms, at least in Michigan, we're looking at about 12% uh, of the total that's used actually on the farmstead for the milking operation. And that's going to be the focus for what we're going to do today. Uh, looking at just a few other of the quick numbers, this is going to be kind of the basis for what you're going to hear about next week, uh, the milk, milk cooling system. We're finding here in Michigan that uh, ranges to about 20%. Uh, we're going to get a little bit into this area today, too, but water heating and waterers and uh, that sort of thing, we found that of those that we have done, that's about 18% uh, uh, of the dairy uh, usage. This is one that, we, that might be a little surprising and could be perhaps different in different states, uh, but we're finding that the amount of energy used on feeding turns out to be only about 2%. Uh, there's a reminder right there, you'll notice the... <laughs> Apparently, body piercing is uh, is big on cows too. See, so when you're out, if you're out doing energy audits, make sure if you're not used to being around them much, make sure that you uh, are aware of um, uh, of those with a ring in their nose. They could be a nasty uh, situation if you're not careful. Um, let's continue here. Uh, milk, uh, the uh, the manure handling area, and this can take a lot of different forms and so forth, but we're finding, that in, at least in Michigan, that's about 14% of the total farms today. Uh, ventilation, this could actually vary quite a bit depending upon uh, different areas. Some other states have found this to be, to be higher, and perhaps it's the cooler uh, summer evenings that we find here in Michigan, uh, but only about 8%. Uh, of the energy use in dairy farmsteads that we found so far seem to be uh, tied up in the area of uh, ventilation. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of, of some of the more recent figures that we've just been crunching uh, on, on the, of the actual farm detailed farm energy audit. If we take a look at some of the data from uh, from the, what we know is uh, there was a study back in Wisconsin, and uh, actually the data is from back in the early uh, 2000s, but it, it kind of predicts that dairy farms, you can probably save somewhere between 10 and 40 percent if you do a thirty thorough uh, job of it. Uh, in New York, uh, I'm not sure they look at everything on the dairy farm. They were predicting uh, their numbers showed 10.1 percent was the average that they saved on farms. If you take the ones that we've done so far in Michigan that we're reporting right now, 
we're finding an average reduction. That's assuming that they implement all of the recommendations that we're making. Um, and uh, that, that involves 31.8%. Uh, There's kind of a key factor, and that's going to come up a little bit later on, probably about a month from now. I think probably Al Go is going to be mentioned a little bit about that, and that is to be able to, where can you find sources of money to help the farmers finance some of the changes? Uh, and, and that'll be talked about uh, in the future, and I think that's a very key factor about getting the job done. Just real quickly, um, the, the, the bottom two pie charts are actually the New York and the Wisconsin data, uh, and that's been available for a while. The top pie chart is brand new. You're seeing that for the first time, and that's the uh, analysis of the data that we've just been completing here in just the last uh, few days of the stuff that we've been working with, and I just showed you some of those. Uh, some of those numbers. So that's a little bit about uh, of where we're going. So what you need then to do is to take a look at those areas to where we can potentially save quite a bit uh, and then zero in on those uh, uh, to make sh to see if we can uh, further reduce the amount of energy that is used in some of those areas. Primary focus of this presentation is going to be on the milking system. Here's what we're going to discuss today, basically, is recall that in uh, Michigan that the milking systems, that is mainly the vacuum pump, represent about 12% of energy use. Uh, my guess is that this value probably would have been higher a little bit a few years ago because many of the farms that, that we conducted audits on are already using variable frequency drives. I need to point that out. You hear the term VFD and sometimes VSD, some people call them variable speed drives. It's the same thing. They're just a different word for the same thing. I'll probably use the term variable frequency drive, and I'll explain the basis of that a little bit later on as we go through this discussion. Uh, let's look a little bit more about some of the background about where we're at, because I think this may be useful to you, and it'll be helpful also with the other speakers who are going to be talking about uh, uh, dairy uh, uh, management and so forth. Um, our program basically is farm and rural business uh, energy management program. And we really got started kind of late compared to some of the other states, but in about 2006. And at the beginning, our primary focus was training certified farm energy auditors and providing them with technical backup technical support. You can train the people, you can put them out in the field but somebody needs to be available to be able to help them out. And we've been able to find that we have about 30 trained people. I'd say probably about maybe 15 of them are pretty active in doing uh, farm energy audits on a continual basis, and we're continuing to uh, to, to produce those. And we're finding that, that uh, we have quite a backlog and a lot of people who are requesting farm energy audits. So, so that's the kind of the basis from where... Uh, of the main emphasis for what we're doing in Michigan. This is just an example of, of the certification we provide. It's important to realize that, that when somebody applies for funding in the future that they really need to back that up, their, their request, with a, with a, uh, a good farm uh, energy audit. And uh, uh, the USDA accepts state certified farm energy auditors of which this is one program and we're working with some other states in being able to help them implement programs uh, as well. Mike Marvin here for example on this particular one uh, works for the Michigan Milk Producers and he's doing farm energy audits for their members continuously. Um, some of the personnel involved, I'm the one on the left. Uh, and <laughs> another important part of our program is Dr. Stephen Harsh. He's probably our wind guru, so some of you may know him. And if you want to know whether or not it's economically feasible or how to find out whether or not it's economically feasible to get into wind energy, you need to listen to his discussions. Uh, he can uh, give you a good insight into that area. In two or three weeks, I think actually June 16th, you're going to hear from this guy, John Althaus. John works with me here. He, we actually have an electrical apprenticeship program here at Michigan State, and uh, John coordinates that program. Uh, and he's probably our go-to person when it comes to 
to seeing the latest technologies and equipment and so forth, particularly lighting. And John's going to be talking to you about lighting. And one of the interesting things about this is that that you don't always have all the facts, especially when it comes to agricultural applications. And he's going to tell you some tests he's running to be able to determine how some of these new light sources actually work on farms. Some of you may already have some experience. Well, in some cases they don't. And John will be able to answer a lot of those questions for you. Uh, here's Al Go. Al basically manages uh, uh, our um, uh, energy uh, audit program and so forth. Um, he is um, he keeps up with who's who in the farm energy area and particularly who's got money that maybe the farmers can get a hold of to be able to implement some of the recommendations uh, that we're making. Uh, if some of you are actually from Wisconsin, you may recognize those two ladies there. They work for Focus on Energy, and they're actually Michigan certified farm energy auditors as well. Um, Eric Wittenberg uh, is a specialist in ag and food and resource uh, economics, and he probably manages uh, some of the activities at the university dealing with um, uh, uh, wind energy, but in particularly works with us on farm energy auditor training. Uh, and here's the guy you're going to hear next week. Uh, Robin uh, is a consulting engineer, been trained as a certified energy auditor, and he is uh, uh, he's going to be here to talk about cooling systems, uh, including uh, water heating and heat recovery and that sort of thing uh, uh, next week. And uh, finally, uh, this is probably the person that really got us going. Uh, she works with uh, Michigan uh, EPA, uh, Terry Novak, and uh, it, it always helps to be able to have uh, good allies with the, with, the, with the state and federal government working alongside you. And Terry's been a real uh, go-getter to help us get things done. Well, those are all the people involved. Uh, just a quick reminder, Scott already told you that we have available. Uh, these are some of the tech notes. And some of the stuff and some of the pictures I'm going to show you are actually in these tech notes, and there's a lot more detail on some of the subjects. So uh, you, you may find them useful uh, in this discussion. Okay. Uh, some think the sky is the limit here uh, with uh, saving energy, but let's get right down to the facts here and, and take a look at some of the details. You're going to see this picture probably in uh, other discussions in the future. But... This is the overall uh, electrical or the uh, uh, milking system. And I just want to point out to you a little bit here, and I think you can probably see a little, little dot on your screen now. Uh, coming from the cow, for example, uh, and, and, and I don't mean to be, uh, you know, some of you probably have seen more dairy farms you'd ever like to, and others may be not so familiar, so just let me just, so bear with me if I say some. Show you some actual components if you're not. Uh, the milk ultimately ends up in the receiver where we have to have a milk pump. The bulk tank ultimately, and the, we're going to talk about the pre cooler or plate cooler, uh, and I'll explain that activity in, in a moment or two, and it's in between in, uh, in that area. Uh, we're going to center on the milking system back here, and in particular the vacuum pump. And we can probably predict that we could probably save, if we just have a constant speed motor, uh, on average, uh, we can probably cut the energy used for that component to well under 50%, and 60% average is, is, not, is not unreasonable. And that's done by this variable frequency drive. And we're going to talk about that in some detail. Also, when this milking system is variable frequency drives are sometimes used to run the milk pump. We're going to talk about that a little bit as well. How does that accomplish energy savings, if there are any savings, and what can you accomplish from that? We're going to talk a little bit about the plate cooler. You're going to get more details, actually, on that from Dan Schrauben next week. So we're just going to kind of get into sort of the general overall uh, idea here. But, for example, in this case, we're trying to take the milk, which is coming from the cow, at approximately 100 degrees, 
and bring it down to approximately 40 degrees at the tank. Okay, it's a good idea to put, or it's it's more beneficial to cool the milk some before it gets to the milk tank. On the other hand, that also reduces uh, the amount of uh, the amount of energy required for the uh, for the cooling compressor, for example, and um, and that plate cooler accomplishes that. It takes well water, okay, and it's basically a heat exchanger, and you end up with a discharge water now can't be used for sanitary purposes back in the uh, in the milk house. So, what are some of the other uses? And we'll just take a quick look at some of the ideas for where this water is. Uh, uh, ultimately, that ends up in the compressor uh, having to work uh, less often. And some of the calculations with respect to this, you're going to get into those next week. Uh, and preheating water, like these, what they call the free heaters or the, or the heat exchangers to where the compressor heat is actually being used for water heating uh, and then any excess then can end up being uh, uh, cooled. So, so we'll look at that in a little bit more detail. Okay. Okay. The uh, <clears throat> this is kind of a, a little bit more of a detail as well as the milking system itself. Once again, here let me just point out a few particular components of this. The uh, this is the cow itself in this row here that I'm showing you. Okay, and the milker itself. So the vacuum pump is going to be uh, providing airflow for that, but also uh, to move some of the milk. The milk then ultimately ends up uh, in this receiver jar, which then ends up getting pumped into the bulk tank. Now, the the airflow rate required for this uh, is highly variable. So anytime that you can find an operation, whether it be a commercial or an industrial or a farm or whatever, to where you have a motor providing power, but the need for that power ranges quite a bit. In this case, <coughs> this is a great, the, the, the load on that motor is going to vary constantly. Um, and particularly, what we're concerned about here is, is that, that during the washing cycle, uh, we, we have to have a pretty high airflow rate. Um, and yet, there's times when during the milking, the airflow rate can be much, much smaller. So that makes it a prime candidate then uh, for a variable frequency drive. Because in order to be able to maintain the, the constant vacuum level that you need, then this regulator, which I'm circling right there, then is going to maintain that, uh, that level. That's if, that's if we're running with a constant, with a uh, constant speed motor. Um, the next one shows what can we accomplish if we go to a variable frequency drive. So the variable frequency drive then runs the vacuum pump, okay? As a result, when there is a less need for airflow rate, it responds to that, and it will slow the motor down. We're going to take a look at how that accomplishes energy savings in just a few moments. As a result, then, the variable frequency drive is varying the speed of the motor rather than the regulator having to allow air to uh, be seeped into the into the system. So the result then is is that we have a lower power requirement and a result uh, lower uh, energy use during that milking operation. So we're going to examine how that whole process actually is accomplished. Here, for example, is the is the single phase motor. You can see that way back in there that, you know, operating the the vacuum pump. Um, and it is to talk about backup a little bit later on because that's one of the issues. What if your variable frequency drive uh, should uh, uh, should fail on you? Okay. Here are some of the other components involved. By the way, up here in the upper right hand corner, you see I, I, this may some people may take exception with this, but because of efficiency and so forth, roughly when I have to do some quick estimation. I usually just assume that uh, if I have to go from horsepower to kilowatts, I just assume that one horsepower is equal to approximately one kilowatt energy uh, uh, estimates in my head and so forth. Uh, here's a vacuum pump, uh, and then, of course, we're going to be talking about compressors a little bit later on for the milk cooling and so forth. Okay. Okay, let's look. Now, we, we looked at those schematic diagrams a little real quickly. 
uh, looking at some of the actual components. And, and if you don't, uh, if you're not familiar with uh, with dairies that much, then uh, there's the basically the uh, the inflations are inside of these uh, stainless steel shells. This is considered to be the claw, okay, where the milk collects and then it goes into the pipeline from that point. Okay, uh, it ultimately ends up then by gravity flow and vacuum to the receiver jar. Uh, where at some point in the system there's, it's going to the, the milk is going to collect and then it gets pumped periodically as it fills up into the into the tank. Now from that pump to the tank, it may go through a plate cooler, and we'll look at that that system in a few minutes. One thing you need to get used to if you're going to go out and do farm energy audits and so forth is to be able to kind of recognize single phase and three phase and that sort of thing, and we're going to talk about those things in a few minutes, but like, for example, would you consider this to be a single phase or a three phase? And this actually, you can see these two little humps right here on the motor are actually the capacitors, and you aren't going to have those on a three phase motor. So right off the bat, we know that that's a, that's a, that's a single phase motor in that, in that uh, uh, at least it's running uh, that milk pump. Okay. Uh, here's the plate cooler. This is going to be between that milk pump we just saw. And the um, um, and the bulk tank. So this is the heat exchanger. You've got well water. You see all the piping here. The well water that's going through here, and milk that's going through here, and it's bringing the temperature down. And you can expect the temperature probably be reduced, probably on average down maybe around 65 degrees or so forth. Uh, you can take about uh, 30 to 40 uh, degrees off of that, depending upon goes through there, okay, and then that's that's actually again going to end up reducing the amount of uh, energy use uh, with respect to the the cooling system, okay, and then ultimately then ends up being in the bulk tank itself, okay. Uh, here's just an example of if you if you're running the the vacuum system with a, at a constant speed with a constant horsepower demand that motor is working hard all the time during milking, and this regulator then is letting air into the system so that you can maintain a constant vacuum level. So uh, in essence, then, you're pumping air that doesn't need to be pumped, and that's going to cost you an awful lot of excess energy. And there's where the variable frequency drive uh, makes sense on the system. Uh, this just shows the, the claw hooked up for the washing cycle, okay? To a large extent, I'd say that probably the one, at least one of the maximum uh, airflow rates that you need on this system needs, is, is for the washing cycle. But when you're actually milking cows, unless you've got milking units that are sucking air, falling off the cows and so forth, your airflow rate needed during that time is much, much less. So it, it can be as much as maybe only a quarter as much as you would need for the washing cycle. So if you have to if you have to size it for the milking cycle, but yet all during the milking period, which is the majority of the use of the unit, it doesn't need that airflow rate, then we're wasting a tremendous amount of energy. So if you just look at the time of the washing cycle, automatically you can see that that you're working that motor on that vacuum pump really, really hard most of the time when it doesn't need to work that hard. Where tremendous amount of savings can be made if we can just re get the motor to respond to the amount of energy that's needed to get the job done. So we're going to examine that then for a minute. Look at this for just a second here. It kind of summarizes what I, what I just said. For example, the pump is basically sized to the maximum demand. That's probably the washing cycle. Uh, the flow of air that you need is not uniform. It, it changes constantly. And those of you who have been around these know that. If you've seen a variable frequency drive, you can hear it changing pitch constantly. It's only at less, actually less than 1% of the time does that vacuum pump have to actually perform at its maximum level during the day. So if that's the case, then we're wasting energy for this whole process, okay? Um, so we're wasting energy. 
uh, a pump running at full at full speed is noisy, although I find variable frequency drive pumps noisy too, but perhaps not as noisy, okay? Okay, so let's take a look at it closely. Here just happens to be one. Notice here too it says VSD, which is variable speed drive. It's the same thing, variable frequency. And I'm going to show you how frequency and speed basically are the same thing uh, in just a moment or two. What does it do? That device converts either single phase or three phase. 60 hertz AC power, it converts it into DC. And then it takes the DC and inverts it back into an alternating current at a different frequency. And we say, well, why do we need it at a different frequency? And that's basically because the motors that run these vacuum pumps are what we call AC induction motors. And the AC induction motor is basically a constant speed motor. Now, it varies some depending on load, but it basically is a fixed speed motor. And the speed, however, though, is based on the input cycles of the AC that's supplying the motor. So if we want the motor to go slower, then we've got to slow down the frequency of the, of the AC that is being supplied to the motor. And that's what the variable frequency drive does. Up until the point to where these variable frequency drives came into play, we weren't able to vary the speed easily of an induction motor, and now we can. And so in that respect, that is it's quite, a, uh, uh, quite a development so forth. So let's, let's just take a few moments. I've got two or three slides here, or several slides, that kind of show you how an induction motor works. Now, this is, this is the, the induction motor. Here's the rotor on the inside. Now, I'm just showing it. You've heard of the term squirrel cage motor. If you were to take the rotor out of a motor, there are no windings in there. All it is is an aluminum structure. It looks kind of like you see right here. If you could, can you imagine maybe taking a, a, if it was big enough, take a squirrel and put it in there and use it as an exercise. That's kind of how it got its name, actually. That's why they call it a squirrel cage kind of motor. This is actually an aluminum structure. So where there are bars back and forth, and they're all shorted out on the end with these, these rings and so forth. Here's what happens. If this was a magnet, and you were to grab a hold of this handle and crank it, let's say we we're going to turn it. So let's turn it clockwise. Then what will happen then is, is this magnetic field right here will actually induce a current flow into that aluminum uh, squirrel cage, and this squirrel cage will follow it. It will go in the same direction, but at a little bit slower speed. Let's look at it more in more detail. Now, we don't want to have to crank it, so what we find is if we go with a three-phase motor, as a three-phase motor, and put three windings in there, okay, we can, because the phases are offset a little bit, there's one, there's one, and there's another. Notice they don't, the time is a little bit different, so the timing means then that the north pole is first at one pole, then it's here, then it's here. You know, if I reverse two of the windings, it'll our uh, leads rotate the other way, so it's easy to reverse a three-phase motor. This red structure right here is representing the magnetic flux or the magnetic field created by these three different sine waves going into those windings, and that's that actually that sine wave is rotating. Without with everything is stationary in the motor, but the magnetic flux is actually rotating. This, the, the diagram is a two-pole motor, but if it was a four-pole motor, which is common, then, as you see in the block down at the bottom, the flux actually moves at 1,800 revolutions per minute for that four-pole. That rotor will follow it, but a little bit slower. It will not go at the same speed. If I was to slow that rotation of the magnetic field down, then the rotor will slow down. So the only way to basically control the speed of an induction AC motor is to control the, the, the frequency of the sine waves that are going into that motor, and that's what the variable frequency drive does. Okay, so this just shows the, the circulation of, of currents that get induced into that squirrel cage. Okay, and then finally, if we put it all together, all right, this right here is the magnetic flux that's rotating at, let's say, 1,800 revolutions per minute, and it creates a, it's a magnetic field 
in the rotor, which follows it. So whatever direction the magnetic flux is turning, that rotor will follow it. So this over here at the side shows what's actually going into the variable frequency drive. I'll, I'll ex it doesn't look like a sine wave, okay? I'll explain that in a moment, okay? But this is slow frequency. This is a higher frequency, okay? So that determines how fast the motor will go. Over at the side here, for example, and these are only approximate. If I have 60 hertz going into the motor, the field is at 1800 RPM, but the rotor actually turns at about 1740, okay? If I have 50 hertz, it's, it only, it, it turns at about 1440. If it's 40 hertz and so forth, you can see the difference, okay? If I slow down the frequency, I slow down the rotor, okay? So by changing the frequency of the input current, the induction motor shaft speed can also be changed. And that's basically the idea of how the variable frequency drive works. Now, in one of the tech notes, you have this diagram, okay? And this is basically what's on the inside of a variable frequency drive. You can introduce at this point as the input either single phase or three phase power. Inside of it is something called a rectifier. This is basically the same arrangement as the rectifier on the alternator of your car. There are six diodes in there to rectify the current coming out of your alternator before it goes to the battery in your electrical system. It gets triggered and then it ends up being DC, okay? And then the DC is introduced into an inverter, which is controlled based upon the sensors that are on the milking system. And out of it comes a reconstructed alternating current. It is not a sine wave. Now, in some cases, you can, you can get it to produce a sine wave, but that's a lot more expensive. The most common one is called pulse width modulation. In other words, it's just a series of pulses. And the spacing between the pulses is, is sometimes wide and sometimes narrow. As far as the motor is concerned, it almost thinks of it as a, as a sine wave, but uh, we don't need to worry about that. But it's not actually a sine wave that is going to the motors. And it is three phase. So an important thing to remember is that a variable frequency drive can only be used to drive a three phase motor. So if you've got a single phase customer with a single phase vacuum pump, he's going to have to maybe use that as a backup one, but he's going to have to buy a new one with a three phase motor on it because you've got a, the variable frequency drive is made to drive a three phase uh, electric motor. The input, however, can be single phase or three phase, as we'll see in this next slide. If you're, if the farmer only has single phase available, notice that I'm only got two input wires and I'm only using a portion of the rectifier to be able to create the current. But once it's current into DC, it doesn't matter after that point. It's just that uh, the, the only issue here is that the variable frequency drive has got to be made a little bit, um, you've got to oversize the drive uh, if you hook it, if you, listen, well the example is if I was going to run a 10 horsepower motor, I'm probably going to need a 15 horsepower variable frequency drive because I, otherwise I'll overwork the diodes and probably burn them out. The manufacturer will give you the the recommendations if you're running a variable frequency drive from a single phase source. But it can be done, okay? It's just that you have to oversize the unit a little bit to compensate uh, for that. Here's an actual farm with a variable frequency drive, and there are several other points that we need to talk about here. This three phase motor is being run by this variable frequency drive, okay? However, though, um, what if, being an electronic device, what if it should fail? And in fact, the day we were here about, I'd say two or three weeks prior to our visit at this farm, this one had failed and had to be replaced. In the meantime, they had a backup system to be able to keep it, because this farm had a little over 600 cows at it. That's an awful lot of hand milking if you didn't have a backup system. So, so we're going to talk about that in a moment, is that when you rec make a recommendation of this type, uh, you need to be able to operate if this thing goes out of service. Uh, so uh, that's important to keep in mind. 
I want to show you this formula for a moment. This is also in one of the tech notes to show you how this works. This is just the formula for horsepower. Two times pi times the revolutions per minute of the motor times the torque it develops divided by 33,000. That's if torque is in foot pounds. Okay? And that number is different if it's in newton meters or something else. Okay? But here's the important thing. We got to develop a certain amount of torque to maintain that vacuum level. But if the airflow rate decreases, then we don't have to work it as hard. The result then is that we can slow down the RPM. And if we slow down the RPM, then the horsepower goes down. There's a direct relationship between RPM and the power requirement. So there's where you save the energy. Okay? By slowing the motor down, then we get less power. So if we don't need as much power, and we can slow the motor down to be able to, to make that happen. So that's the basic idea. Okay, let's just run a quick example now. Um, you're going to be going to our website, or you can go to our website. You may want to note this. It's, uh, you can see it there on the screen, okay? Uh, and if you, if you pull that up, you won't see the website there, but you'll, this is what the first page will look like. Come down here to the part of calculators. I just want to show you quickly. Uh, uh, how we do some calculations, and as you, as we go through other as other speakers uh, uh, deal with this same issue of dairy farms, you're going to be uh, seeing some more examples of this. If you click on calculators, you'll get this page, and let's just take a look at the vacuum pump and uh, variable speed drive calculator. Okay, so if we go to that part of it, okay, then let's look at this example. Let's say we got 200 cows milk three times a day. We've got 12 milking units involved. Operate that thing for 10 hours a day. Or excuse me, we've got a 10 horsepower motor, uh, and uh, we run three hours uh, uh, per milking. Okay, and the, whether it's the, the electrical service, the single three phase, that comes in based upon one of the numbers that we have to put into the system. So here's the calculator that you'll you'll come up with, and you have to wherever it shows an asterisk, there's one right there. Then we have to put in that number. Okay, and then when we hit update, it'll calculate this for you. And then when we get to the lower portion, wherever you see the asterisk, we have to put in some data there, okay, some information. And so if we do that and we go to the next one, it should look like that. So if we put in 12 units, and it shows us that here's our capacity in CFM, it's recommending, actually, that's a seven and a half horsepower motor, okay. We had a 10, all right. There's 12 units, okay, number of hours of operation. Ultimately, what it calculates for us down here is, is, is what our, our annual, uh, annual savings are in kilowatt hours and in cost, okay. And then if we get down here towards the bottom, we ultimately end up, we have to put in an estimate for the, for the cost of the, uh, of the equipment to install it. Okay. Uh, this also includes uh, the cleaning, so be sure you, you including the cleaning cycle as well when you put in the number of hours of operation, okay? So there's going to be, uh, you've got the wash cycle that has to be added to the milking and so forth, okay? We end up then here with, notice down here at the bottom, a two-point, basically a little over a two-year payback period. We're going to look at another application here, and the payback period is going to end up being larger. And so that's what you can have to take a, a look at. Okay, so basically then, this particular example, we're estimating that, that we'd basically be able to pay it back and, and, and now be making money in a little, just a little over two years. Yes, I've got uh, numbers go in, and then ultimately there's that final, final savings and so forth. Uh, from uh, from this. Okay, let's move on. Here is another. Here's another situation. This is back to that same diagram. Kind of this diagram also not quite red like this, but this diagram is also in one of those in one of those tech notes. This is the normal operation. And what if the variable frequency drive should fail, but yet the vacuum system is still operational? Well, in a range what we call a bypass situation. It's just a normal line voltage controller, just like a motor starter. And it is isolated basically by by two 
double pole switches, kind of like the similar to switches that you'd use for maybe a standby generator situation, okay? But, but all are inside. So the situation here is, is that, that under normal operation, the power then, three phase power comes in, or this could be single phase actually. Well, it can't be because we can't drive a three phase motor. Okay, so, uh, so this would be the normal operation. If we, if the variable frequency drive should fail, for example, then we can switch it over and operate this directly from the power line, which ultimately means we aren't going to be saving any energy, but at least we get the cow's milk until we're able to replace the unit. So it, ne it is important that these electronic devices can fail, that it's important to be able to think about a backup or else somebody's going to be in real trouble if they've got a lot of cows to milk and no way to get that job done. One way is to set up a bypass situation for the variable frequency drive. Another is to have a complete separate uh, vacuum system available. To, uh, in the case of a single phase supply of the farm, remember you're driving a three phase motor from the variable frequency drive. You can't drive that off a single phase. So in that case, you'd have to have a complete backup pump situation, be able to turn that on in the event that the that the variable frequency drive should fail. There are some issues with this too, and that is is that sometimes if you just have a backup system, exercise it on a regular basis, it might not be operational when you need it. So it's suggested that if there is a backup system, that it get maybe used on, let's say, for example, once a week at least for the washing cycle or something so that you know that the system, and if it's not, then So if you're making these recommendations to farmers, for example, then you need to be sure that, uh, that they realize that that back backup system does need to be used on a regular basis to make sure that it's working. Okay, let's look then, move ahead, and take a look at the situation of a variable frequency drive used on that milk pump situation. This is a single phase motor here, but what if we took that off of there and we put on a, a variable frequency drive and that gets plate replaced by a three phase electric motor? Um, in that situation, uh, we have to take a look at what the savings could possibly be, and those savings, for example, um, are probably more in the increasing the efficient cooler, which you see an example of a plate cooler. The the uh, the milk collects in that receiver jar and it is periodically pumped. So it's kind of like you get a lot of milk flow and then none, and you have a lot of milk flow and then none. For example, if this was run with a variable frequency drive. Generally, the the milk flow rate, rather than being on and off, on and off, seems to be uh, spread out more continuously. That's going to help you in the efficiency of the uh, plate cooler, and it'll probably bring the temperature down just a little bit more. So the savings, more likely, are going to be in in reduced milk cooling. Uh, so the issue here is a lot of expense in that. Uh, installation of the, of the variable frequency. The farmer is probably milking maybe 10 hours or more a day. The payback period for putting a variable milk pump is probably going to be a little bit longer than they can, than they can justify. So um, uh, it's not really quite uh, as an obvious situation, and I would say that some farmers will find it a lot more uh, beneficial to go to a variable frequency drive on that milk pump if they're milking for long periods during the day than those who may be milking for short periods. So it, th that situation could depend on the particular situation. Let's look briefly at where does the water go? What do you do with the water from this variable, fr from the plate cooler? Uh, you're going to get into more of that details later, but real quickly here, for example, uh, in some cases, they just run it into a tank, and if it gets full, then it runs over onto the ground. Um, but in, there are some farmers 
who collect it in a tank and then run it through a pressure water system to be able to to water the uh, uh, normal waters that are stationed uh, throughout the uh, throughout the, the, the farmstead uh, and so that's been uh, uh, in, in that situation then if there isn't enough water coming from the plate cooler then it just gets supplemented by the normal well water system to be able to make up the difference here's an example where uh, the tank was being used to collect the water from the plate cooler and then it was being pumped uh, throughout the farm for watering the cows. The problem, this particular farm had a little bit of problem seeing that sunlight could get on this tank. They were having an algae problem. So putting it outside like this where the sun can get at it could be an issue. Uh, so that was, the system worked well except that they had a, they had to control the algae issue. Here's another farmer, however, though, who those tanks inside so they aren't exposed sunlight, they're probably dark most of the time, and the system worked well, uh, but they didn't have a problem with uh, with algae in this case. At least they said they didn't. Here's a case to where the arrow was pointing to actually a dump tank to where by gravity the water is just going to that point, and then it tips over and dumps, and it's, there's quite an uh, angle to the holding area and it's used to keep the holding area clean. So there's various applications, um, but when you put in a plate cooler, you're taking water out of the ground, and then you got to it's going to go somewhere. So you got to be thinking about uh, about that issue. Let's let's look at watering for for just a quick minute here. Um, uh, this can be a, another issue. We find that in a lot of the Midwest states, it, even though we get some cold periods. It frequently, with some of the newer waterers, they do ha have a tendency to hold the heat a little bit better. And this particular farm is in southern Michigan, uh, and they seldom have to heat the water. They have, that the arrow was pointing to an outlet up there, which is installed to plug in kind of a donut-shaped water or a heater, that they lift that red cover and slip it right in next to the uh, um slip it right in next to the uh, the float and it and it works fine for them but in many unless it really gets cold and stays cold for quite a while like down around zero and so forth uh, then this particular farmer said they don't really have much of a problem if it sets outside to where the wind's going to blow across it then it may be more of an issue uh, I want to look a little closer at what the arrangement that they made to be able to do this they only wanted water heating up here for or this for for that purpose. In some of the poles, they had a receptacle over here on the side to be used for normal normal use. Uh, this pipe right here was to, to just to run the cord that was on the end of that uh, heater because it was they take them out during the summer and only put them in during the winter and it just plugs into that uh, uh, to that outlet. This is just to keep the, the cows from getting at it and maybe chewing on it uh, uh, otherwise. Um, Another issue here, this ground wire actually was put in for stray voltage protection issues and so forth. I do want to make a reminder about about some of the new code requirements require that in these locations that you put in ground fault interrupter protected circuits. Um, you, you can have some problems. I mean, I have a farm myself, and I have freezing problems, and I had to change these out because... They say they won't nuisance trip, but they do. Uh, so, so anyway, I, I, but the electrical code, depending on what the codes are in in, in various areas, uh, in Michigan, for example, the, the electrical code does not mandate rules for farmers, uh, but in some states they do, and, and I guess you're going to have to deal with that issue. But what I find is that. That grounding is really, really important. Do a good job of making sure everything is properly grounded. Uh, but ground fault interrupters, uh, I'm nervous about them tripping. Okay. Anyway, um, you can eliminate a lot of these uh, uh, heaters and waters in many cases. This is just one example. Uh, there's a lot of different types of uh, energy-free waters. And uh, I don't have a lot of experience with these. Uh, some farmers like them, some farmers don't. Uh, so uh, 
but uh, these are an alternative and because those heaters in the, especially those metal stock watering devices are going to lose a lot of heat, especially if they're put outside in areas to where the wind's going to be blowing out across them and they're going to be exposed directly to the weather, uh, as you would see in this particular case. Okay? Oh. Vacuum pumps, for example. Okay? Uh, we're guessing here that we're, or we're finding that the savings are about 12 to 17 percent in Michigan. It's 12 percent. I think some work done in Wisconsin indicated that, that about 17 percent of the uh, energy uh, uh, is used by basically the vacuum system. Let's take a quick look at, at two of the most popular ones, which are the sliding uh, vane rotary type and the rotary lobe type of water heater, or uh, excuse me, of, of vacuum pumps. Here's the, the highest efficiency, the rotary lobe blower type. Placing a vacuum pump, and they need to really look at the efficiency uh, of the units that are out there. Here's one. The vacuum type is the sliding vein, which is there are other types, but these are the two most popular ones. These tend to throw a lot of oil out the exhaust and so forth, so you probably you may be familiar with uh, those particular ones. This is a study that was done at Cornell, and it just shows blower, the rotary blower type is the highest efficiency, followed by the vein type, and then the other ones are further down. Uh, uh, down the uh, the way, so uh, be sure that uh, that in replacing them to look at efficiency because this pump is on a lot of the time, so it's going to be pretty significant. I want to also talk briefly just for a moment here about about uh, efficiency of motors. Sometimes, even if you do a variable frequency drive, oversizing uh, significantly oversizing the uh, the motor for an application. Uh, I want you to notice here a little bit what happens with the efficiency of, of induction motors. Uh, this is if the motor is running at its typical horsepower, the blue, vertical blue line. Okay, the red line there basically is what the efficiency kind of looks like uh, as the motor is overloaded and underloaded. Notice that the efficiency remains pretty high until you start getting below about 70% of full load. And at that point now, the motor, the efficiency begins to drop off very, very rapidly. So if you drastically oversize a motor, uh, the motor is going to be running at lower efficiency. Now, I know manufacturers give you an efficiency for a motor, but that's only based upon that motor running under the ideal test conditions under full load. And most of the time, that motor is probably not running under full load. And so the result then is, is that that if you, again, if you oversize greatly, then the motor is running much under its load and its efficiency cascades pretty rapidly at that particular point, okay? Um, okay, uh, there's, uh, Scott's been very helpful to us in the past here in uh, working with some of our, uh, particularly as we got into the greenhouse area. Let's look really, really briefly at three phase and then we'll be finished up here, okay? Uh, single phase power um, basically is if you got two wires, all right, and uh, there's the and it's a the system configuration looks sort of like this. Three phase power, we, there's three wires that are supplying the power to us, and it can be either in the form of a wire or a delta. And we'll look at those in just a moment. Let's look briefly at some of the advantages, one way or the other, in terms of energy cost savings. Probably not a big issue. It's a matter of, of what it will do for you, for example. Um, in, you need to check the utility costs. In many areas, there is an advantage to being having your residence also on the same meter with the farm uh, uh, set up and being on single phase rate as compared to being on the three phase general service rate. So you need to look at the rate structure to find out if there's any major cost advantages and that varies from one area to another, one utility to another. Um, motors uh, uh, basically are smaller size and, and less expensive if they're three phase as compared to uh, a single phase motor. Energy savings, uh, probably not a big issue. Um, if you oversize 
if you maybe increase the size of, of the wires supplied to some of these motors uh, or other circuits that are long circuits, for example, uh, we find that that projects into about a 3% savings for, for long set, and that's just by, by increasing the size of wire that's going to some of these uh, uh, electric motors. Um, okay, single phase, and, and the, there, is, there are two tech notes that will give you the background, so I'm going to go through these really, really quickly, but these are basically there, and you can get more off the tech note. This is just the 120, 240-volt, three-wire electrical system, and if you balance the loads here, you get zero basically current on the neutral, okay? This is what it's going to look like from the utility, typical service panel, the two hot wires coming in, and then there's the neutral. That's a 240-volt circuit. Here's a 120-volt circuit. Now, uh, three-phase, you're probably not going to see an ungrounded delta very often, okay? More likely, a corner-grounded delta, and I know that yeah, I've worked on a number of farms in Wisconsin. By three-phase power at 240 volts with a corner ground and delta system, similar to what you see right here. Okay. Here is some of the larger farms are probably going to be Y-connected systems. There's 120 volts, but it's not 240. It's only 208 volts. So you have to realize that on, on these Y systems, there's some advantages of doing going to a Y electrical system like this, but the trade-off is you've got 208 volts, not 240. Okay. If you read through the tech note, that's tech note 220, a lot more uh, on these systems, okay? Uh, this is the same system, but it runs for, this is for more large operations to where you want to run the motors at 480 volts, but fine to neutral voltage is 277. That electric discharge lighting, but you can't use it for plugs. You'd have to put in a separate transformer. This is a very popular one to where you have single phase and three phase off the same. There's our normal 120, 240 volt single phase system, but you've also got three phase as well. Okay? All in the same panel. Notice that there are a pole breaker is left out. That's because that wire right there is considered the high leg. It's marked with orange tape. Some utilities will not supply you with that power and others will. The nice thing about it is that you got both single phase and three phase out of the same panel. The problem is you've got one leg in there, high voltage on it, okay? So you have to be careful about that. Briefly looking at the overall electrical system, the power suppliers do give you three-phase power. This is coming out of the, south pot, the substation going to the farmers. There are three hot wires and a neutral. This is typical, at least in the Midwest. Okay. Single-phase customer, if you're a single-phase customer, the transformer connects to the neutral and one of the hot wires to give you single-phase power. This also is one of the tech notes. I think these diagrams are in Techno 225 there for you. If you're a three-phase customer, it connects to the neutral. I'll understand what the uh, kind of be able to recognize what the utilities are providing so you can know whether or not the customer, if he's on single phase, whether it will be a fairly easy change over to three-phase. Okay. Like, for example, here are all the wires, but if you go further out, there's only two of them. Where on this system can you get three-phase, and where on this system can you get single-phase? You can get any system once all the wires are available. You can still get three-phase at this point, even though there are one of the phase wires of the utility is missing. One of the tech notes in a little bit more detail and talks to you about that. Okay, so you can get... You can read up on that just a little bit. This is called an open delta. Any one of the delta systems can be operated with a transformer missing. doesn't matter what kind of a delta it is. And that means, then, that you can supply three-phase power in the delta form when there are only two of the utility phase wires available, such as here you go. There is only one is not there. 
but you use two transformers and it's hooked up on the primary side, they call it open Y. But this is a Delta system that the customer can use. So if the customer, if the farm customer can use uh, electrical three-phase power in the form of a Delta, then it can be supplied with only two phase wires uh, available to them. Well, that's kind of quick, and that's why I put some of the tech notes out there. Um, so uh, at this point, I guess, if I've gone too quickly or if you have other questions, uh, at this point, I guess I'm uh, available to answer questions if, if you have some. Scott? Does anybody have questions for Truman? I, well, I think I had one um, earlier. That the In the beginning, Truman, you had um, the graphs for different uh, energy use. I was curious if that was just electricity or was that um, all fuels? That's all fuels, but only for the farmstead, not the field operations. Yep, okay. Because right, I, I was curious. And I was, that was our understanding of the New York and the uh, and the Wisconsin studies as well, that it was farmstead. Yeah, the New York study was just electric. Well, yeah, I think that's right. So that and, and that's why some of those numbers are a little different than what we get in Wisconsin and here in Michigan. Yep, because that's why Basically, I the numbers that. for coming Remember. here in Wisconsin and Michigan are pretty much consistent with the numbers that that were found in the past in Wisconsin. Yep. Well, I was curious because the manure um, uh, numbers were were quite a bit higher than we see sometimes, but that's probably because you're using um, tractor powered mixers for some of it. Yeah, and that's been a <laughs> that's an area we're we're delving into with some of our energy auditors. Yep, because in general we don't find much savings on feeding and manure handling, um, because there just isn't many alternatives, unless uh, you can maybe put a variable speed drive on or or reduce. But what we found kind of uh, is that there are. Um, it, the picture I showed uh, had a tractor uh, running the pump, uh, and it's probably going to be more efficient if they were able to, if they use it enough, it's more efficient if they uh, if they go to electric. And in other cases, diesel they can, motors. pardon? Diesel motors. Yeah, and some, some may have a, may, may put a diesel motor on that. But in some cases, too, then they may, just, uh, they may hire the, uh, uh, some service to come and, and, uh, empty that for them. Of course, I don't know if that's an energy savings necessarily. Okay. It's a convenient uh -huh. farmer. We got a question from Mark Hanna. Uh, what are the range of costs locally for a dairy energy audit in Michigan? The range of costs? Uh, we, we charge $500, and that's partly because um, it's a requirement. Uh, the, w we are we're subsidizing the auditor. And the the actual cost of doing the audit, we're paying uh, the the money. Actually, well, somebody can do it privately if they want to. But if they go through the system here at the university, then then we're paying the the energy auditor seventeen hundred and fifty dollars to do the farm energy audit. The farmer the the but but the the source of the money there is two sources. Part of it is a USDA REAP grant. And part of it is, um, and there's another source we have, which is actually a, a grant through the Michigan Department of Labor and, uh, and Economic Growth. And uh, so either of those sources, uh, they require that the farmer put up 25% of the overall cost of the audit. Uh, so, uh, and and the the reports are also evaluated to make sure that they're complete and that all the information is accurate and uh We've set aside two hundred and fifty dollars of the of a total of of two thousand that's allocated per farm visit. So I guess to to complete the if I guess the bottom line is to do the whole job right, we're paying two thousand dollars for that. Two hundred and fifty basically goes to a reviewer to make sure that the, the final report is complete and correct. And seventeen hundred and fifty Goes to the uh, to the farmer, or excuse me, to the energy auditor themselves. But the farmer only pays five hundred. But the farmer only pays five hundred. Okay. Of that total cost. And that's I assume that's a full farm audit. 
That is a full farmstead audit. It doesn't deal uh, with the field operations, but it is it's everything on the farm. They're very, very complete farm audits. Okay. Any other questions? So hearing none or seeing none, um, I will be sending out a, a evaluation for the program uh, um, later today, and uh, we we really appreciate if you could fill those out. Uh, this has been recorded, and the recording will be available eventually. Actually, I'm going to send you a link to it so you can get at it uh, if you want to hear it again. Um, but eventually, it will be posted on um, the uh, extension.org site. Uh, so if there's no more questions, we'll uh, sign off for the day. And uh, just a reminder, we have um, some more of these. Uh, we have one next Tuesday which is on irrigation, and the one next Thursday, which is again on uh, milk, another component of, of milking systems or dairy farms. So if there's no more questions, we'll call it a day.